Hello, welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness. This is a podcast for women who long to feel, express, and be who they truly are. This time of year, as school is starting and we're trying to get into routines and we're kind of feeling into like, what do I want to create this year? Okay, time to get to work on something. The swift changes that fall will start to bring. I guess it in no way does this show up more powerfully for me, especially as I'm thinking about family routines, mealtime, planning, and all of that. I tend to put that a little lower on the list. Our guest here today has really inspired me to put that as a high soul priority. She talks about this nourishment first kind of mentality, which I kind of have been talking about for years, but for whatever reason on a subconscious level, I tend to go into an avoidance pattern with it. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about why emotional eating has become kind of this checking out, kind of silencing the voice within when it comes to to the practice of eating, which I have come to believe is a spiritual practice that we we have to have alignment with in order to receive that nourishment and step into the life that we are destined to embody. So Jessica has a lot of credentials and she's really made it her life mission and purpose to sort of untangle the physical and the emotional hungers we have and really get clarity around being present while eating. So she's been on this path for about eight years, lives in Philadelphia, and you can check out her website, escapefromemotionaleating.com, and she has some freebies there. I want to remind you about the Stand Speak Shine event that I'm having about embodiment. It's about embodiment embodying your feminine soul, but it's about landing in your body and stepping into yourself, stepping into who you actually are. So a lot of the stuff that Jessica and I will talk about in their depth, will go into more of how those things are embodied and how we really entrain ourselves to listen to the voice within and our soul and, and the divine within so that we can have that powerful body because it's only when you align the body and the soul together that you find your true power. It's not about being like super, super spiritual and and disassociating from this vehicle of the body that maybe you've been programmed is bad and is in the way and whatever. It's about blending them. It's about aligning them. It's about letting them work with each other. And that is where your true power comes from. So go to my website. At the very, very top, you'll see a link to register for that retreat. We have, I think, about 15 spots left and they will go quickly because it's only a couple of months away. So please join me there. Please also enjoy this episode with Jessica as we dive deep into healing emotional eating. Welcome, Jessica, and thank you so much for your time today in discussing emotional eating. I know this is an issue. I literally don't know one female that has not walked through some kind of struggle on this, including myself, and I may share some some pieces of my journey, although I know this is your thing. This is really where you your domain and your ex- expertise and your life experience. Um, can you share with us a little bit about how this became meaningful for you and what you went through in your life to get to you to the point where you knew this is something that you had to share, help, and teach others with. Yeah, so for as long as I can remember, food was always my safety blanket and my best friend. Um, After a long, stressful day, I especially as an adult, I would come home and go right to the pantry, getting my hands on as much dark chocolate as I could and just eating until the stress and the anxiety of the day went away. And at the time, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Um, I did it pretty regularly, almost every day. Um, I always had snacks on me. I always had a food drawer at my desk at work. Um, And it didn't really start to um, catch my attention until I really reached this point where I had tried so many diets. I had tried so many methods to um, really be in control of food and wasn't getting anywhere. 
And it was at this time where I was working out twice a day in the morning and at night. I was eating as clean as I possibly could. And I never felt more out of control with food than I did at that time. It was always on my mind. I always felt magnetized to it. I always felt really hungry even after I just ate. And I really started to feel like I was going insane. Um, and and it was really at that point that I I thought there was something wrong with me. Um, and then I said, there just has to be, there just has to be something else going on. Um, and that was really when, shockingly, I heard that I was an emotional eater and um, that discovery that I was an emotional eater became a catalyst for my freedom and the freedom that I now have where it's been four years since I have emotionally eaten or overeaten. Um, and it, it really feels like such a bold claim to even say that. Um, but the discovery that I was an emotional eater was a massive shocking discovery for me and, and really created a lot of healing in, in my work for myself. And when I discovered it, I was like, well, if this was a shock to me, then there has to be other people out there that need to know about this and not only need to know, but need other resources um, for support and healing as well. Yeah, I think for any issue that we're struggling with that we just can't seem to get to the bottom of or figure out why we're doing it, we always need a mentor or a guide or someone to kind of walk us through what's causing it, number one, and why we're doing it <laughs> and how we can kind of go core with it. So as I'm looking at your picture, I haven't met you personally because you live in Philadelphia, um, but your topic was such a strong draw for me because, you know, again, like I said, every woman deals with this and it's not about the eating. It's about something underneath it. Just like any issue, there's always a root to it that has nothing to do with that issue. It's nothing to do with food. It's what food represents. But as I'm looking at your pictures, I'm like, wow, were you even ever overweight? Like when you say how significant, I know that it started when you were young, so take us through that. But also like how pronounced was it? Because typically when I think of an emotional eater, I think of somebody who was oh, like really obese, like a really severe emotional eater, you know, really obese or um, sort of like, I hate to use this as a stereotype, but maybe frumpy or unkempt or just when I'm talking about someone who is really out of control with it. Um, but you tend to mm -hmm. kind of paint this picture that you hid it really well. Um, so, Oh yeah. <laughs> maybe tell us a little bit about that because <laughs> I know that things are not always as they seem on the surface with most women as they're going through painful, addictive mm -hmm. or compulsive behaviors that they feel out of control with. Yeah. So I love that you brought this up because this is what I'm really most passionate about is that there is a massive stereotype when it comes to emotional eating. And you described it perfectly. Someone who has hundreds of pounds to lose, who like can't get their life together, um, who's really, really struggling and, you know, is 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 someone we would picture as like my 600 pound life you know it would end up on that tv show i used to and I'm not watch discrediting that. that i i'm sorry to interject but i used to watch that with my kids because it made me feel so much better about my own my own life like my own physical body i know that sounds horrible but my mm -hmm. older kids just just laugh like you're watching that again i'm like yeah because someone always has it so much worse than i do but oh my heart break my heart just breaks yeah and that's the people that are in that prison with their bodies Yes. Now that is an extreme example, an extreme in how it physically manifests, right? In the, in the real excess weight. Um, but for me, I was definitely an emotional eater. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, and 
I did not have hundreds of pounds to lose because when it comes to emotional eating, it's not about the quantity. It's not that we have, you know, five cookies and then on the sixth one, you're definitely emotionally eating. What really is emotional eating is using food for a purpose other than fuel. It's using food for a purpose other than fuel. And for me, emotional eating was always present. I mean, the earliest uh, memory that I have was when I was six years old. Um, I was at a neighbor's house uh, with my older brother and they were playing video games. And, you know, as a little six-year-old, I was bored. I don't like video games, but my brother was in charge of watching me and that's what they were doing. Um, and I remember sneaking upstairs because we were playing in the basement. I remember sneaking upstairs into my neighbor's kitchen and his mom had just baked these chocolate chip cookies that had M&Ms in them. And they were sitting in a cookie jar on the counter. And I remember pulling over a stool to that counter and opening that cookie jar and eating every single one of those cookies. And I remember wiping my mouth and like going back downstairs pretending like no one would know. And I still don't know this to this day, but my brother immediately knew what I did. He immediately knew that I had eaten all those cookies. Um, like it was written like all over me. <laughs> um, and that was like my earliest memory. Um, but for a lot of the women that I work with, we are the kind of emotional eaters who are driven. We are successful. We have very high pressure, high stakes kind of lifestyles. And um, the outlet for that stress relief and managing our anxiety really comes through with food. Um, and a lot of times, because we're successful driven women, we will use exercise um, as a way to erase what we emotionally ate, which is just literally a recipe for disaster and a recipe for burnout. And that was very, um, that was very present for me. I danced um, my whole entire life. And then as an adult, I just worked out. Um, and when I couldn't get like control around food, I worked out even more um, because I didn't want to end up with hundreds and hundreds of pounds to lose. Um, but now my relationship with movement is very different. Um, it's very much more moderate, healthy. Um, and from the time that I stopped emotionally eating, I've lost 45 pounds. And I'm not like like if you look at my before and after pictures, like I don't have them <laughs> because when I was emotionally eating, I never wanted to be in pictures, but like there's so much more that goes on behind a picture. There's so much more that goes on when no one's looking. There's right. so much more that goes on in our relationship with food, like in our heads. And that's where the insanity lived for me. Um, the insanity is the same, but you know, how long we're willing to let it go on for varies from person to person. And I got I, very clear very early on yeah. that I was not going to allow it to continue. So I, I there's something that you said that I, I think we should explore a little bit because um, from what I've worked, cause I, I have, um, as part of my coaching program that I take women through who work with me personally in a mentoring process, I, I used to do pageants. I used to direct them. And so, um, the body image thing for me at one time in my life was really up in terms of helping women to just love their bodies, embrace their bodies, no matter what size they were. But for me personally, when I was in training and I was really trying to get like that quote, unquote, perfect body, I recognized that I developed patterns that, um, you know, I would, I could sustain a plan for so long, um, even if it was a really, really grounded, healthy plan, eating plan and nutrition and fitness plan. And then I would self-sabotage um, 
And I know there's probably a lot of reasons that people do that. But I wanted to ask you about using food for a purpose other than fuel, because from some of my research, it feels like there's got to be a balance that we, that food is supposed to be enjoyed. It's not supposed to be something we just use as like an energy source. Um, And I want us to explore that a little bit because I think some women, maybe if they hear that would go, well, gosh, I don't think I can, I don't think I could ever not love food, right? Like I, there's an attachment we have there and it starts really young, as you mentioned. Um, But even as infants, when we cried, we were given a bottle or our mother's milk, right? We, We were always given food when we were sad or alone or, um, so, so it, we were kind of entrained that way. And so just from some of my work with like sensory, um, you know, sensory enjoyment, finding joy in life. And part of that is the sensory experience of eating. There's a, we have taste buds for a reason. We have nose for a reason. So kind of walk us through a little bit. I mean, that was a mouthful to say to you, but um, walk us through a little bit about how can we not look at food as, as something to not enjoy? How do we find that balance between enjoying the food and only using it as fuel? Shouldn't we kind of be emotional eating to some degree? Well, I think it really is about what's the primary intention. And if the primary intention is to cope, to soothe or escape, that's definitely emotional eating. But if the primary intention is to meet the need of physical hunger first, then then like that is healthy eating. Um, but that does not mean that our eating experiences are absent of any joy, uh, pleasure, tasting. Like that is absolutely a part of the eating experience and it needs to be. Um, But food is not the only source of comfort, joy, connection. And it's not its primary intention. Um, When we were babies, you know, we were given food because we like that was all we have. But I think the major missing piece as human beings is we were not taught emotional resilience. We were not taught emotional fitness. We were not taught how to comfort ourselves um, that goes way beyond food. And therefore, food becomes that easy replacement. Um, And it usually is when we are younger um, that we will start to develop these these habits Um, in the same way that you would give a baby like a pacifier. Um, But we don't see adults walking around with pacifiers anywhere. We've grown out of that. Um, But for a lot of us, our caretakers um, never taught us, you know, how to be emotionally resilient. Um, And I think especially in today's day and age where, you know, there's so much technology and technology can be another way to escape or avoid our feelings. Um, I think it's really important that us as adults start to learn, number one, how to be emotionally resilient um, and emotionally healthy so that food can be nourishment first. It needs to be nourishment first because if we don't eat, I mean, straight up we die. (laughs) But it's also what is the primary intention that you are eating? If your primary intention is sad and you don't want to feel sad anymore, that's emotional eating. But if your primary intention is I'm physically hungry and I would also like to have a joyful, nourishing food experience, that's much more in integrity with um, like what needs to happen on a physical level and an emotional level. Um, To to say that the two are separate um, is is a misunderstanding because we are both physical beings and energetic beings. But when it comes to, you know, 
but what about, you know, isn't everyone an emotional eater? It really is about what's the primary intention because the joy um, and the feelings that we receive from the act of nourishing ourselves need to be secondary. Yeah, I think there's a sense of joy that can come from nourishment, right? If if that's the intention. Uh, for me, and I'm sure you have, I know you have a quiz on your website. Uh, it's escapefromemotionaleating.com that people can go to to kind of ascertain where they fall on that spectrum. You know, how, I, I think it's safe to say everyone on the planet probably emotionally eats to some degree because we can't stay emotionally conscious all the time. That's almost impossible, but we can be present and learn the, the skills and tools to be present. For me, I have to look at, because I, this is just me, <laughs> maybe you can coach me on this, but I have t- I've found the times in my life where I was just focused on food being sustenance, like okay, you know, uh, there's certain foods that if I, I know if I eat them, I'm going to feel better. I'm going to have more energy. But if they weren't yummy, then after a period of time, they weren't a sense, it wasn't a sensory rich experience for me. And so I ended up completely sabotaging the nourishment piece because I think we're just programmed to want to enjoy the eating experience. Like, both socially, like if you're going out uh, or you're with family, most families have a culture of eating and enjoyment together, um, whether it's holidays or get-togethers or picnics or barbecues or whatever. Um, but when when it's just me, like when it's just like me, you know, when I'm in my office during the day or I'm out and running around and I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't eaten, <laughs> my first thought isn't, my, well, actually, my first conscious thought is I need to fuel myself. And then what really comes in close, like literally like right on the heels of that is, but it needs to be yummy. <laughs> um, so kind of walk me through, mm-hmm. if you were coaching me, like, um, you know, I want to both, I, I have to enjoy it to, for it to be sustainable. I guess that's kind of what I'm saying. I have to enjoy the food in order for the nourishment model to be sustainable for me. Right. And I can hear as you're talking that there's like a lot of like thinking that's going into the food choices. Mm -hmm. Um, And we can really get into a lot of overthinking when it comes to food Um, because of the dieting world. It's like there's been this training, especially as women, um, that we cannot trust ourselves when it comes to food. And there are certain good foods and bad foods. And it's just like food, it's really messed up. We're just like overwhelmed. There's so many programs out there to... Right. Which is like what I'm what I'm really passionate about is like, we got to cut through the clutter um, and we got to learn how to really understand the language of our bodies so that we can best nourish it. Um, And the way that we understand the language of our bodies is by first managing our stress, our anxiety, and our overwhelm. We have to take that off of our relationship with food because if we don't we will never really be clear on am I making this decision um, because this is what's right for me or am I making this decision because I'm seeking relief from my stress Um, so that's part one is like really clearly understanding um you know, how we manage our own energy. And these are tools and um, trainings that I teach in in my programs. It's the first thing that we do together so that um, we can start to take that overwhelm and that pressure off of our relationship with food. But based on um, what you were saying, I'll go back and say that I would never, ever, ever 
recommend that you eat something that you don't want to eat. Um, this is escaping from emotional eating is never about never having a cookie or a cake or um, the sweet treats that we love. It's really about why are we eating? And are we eating because we had a stressful day and we're looking to escape? Um, and yes, food should be nummy, yummy. It should be nourishing. It um, should really meet our physical needs. But where the lines get blurred is where it starts to become compulsive and where it starts to become something we have to have, um, where you might be, you know, like I was sharing earlier, how I would I would have food on me all the time. Um, and I, I experienced it a lot when I would travel, um, even more so because travel used to be very stressful for me. There's just a lot going on. Um, and I remember just like sitting in my airplane seat as soon as I buckled my seatbelt, like grabbing a snack. And I wasn't hungry. Um, I was doing it because I was nervous. I was anxious. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really about starting to separate um, the emotional energy from our physical needs. And it's what I call untangling physical and emotional hunger. Um, because we as human beings, we do have a hunger for happiness. We do. But the key is, is that if we're not receiving it, in the other areas of our lives, it is going to show up in our relationship with food. Right. Um, and that goes for any other emotional need. But if we're not receiving it in a healthy way, it's going to show up on our plate and it's going to be, and food is going to be used as a replacement. So that's so interesting because um, I, I teach that in my coaching programs as well as uh, the ability to be present with your body and to really listen to it and to check in because everything's about managing your energy, right? Everything in life, every single endeavor. Mm -hmm. And I this would be no different, obviously, but it, it's interesting how we over identify with our physicality at the expense of neglecting the emotions that are trying to talk to us. And so yes. I, I guess where I go to first when you said understanding why, some people are just, um, I guess the word is apathetic. Like you just get to a point where you're like, I don't care. <laughs> and I guess that goes back for me as kind of with my psychology background is, how do you get people to care enough about themselves that they would make nourishment a priority? And that's what my programs gear towards because there's just this like basement of women, especially women and men too, but I see it more in women, not feeling worthy to um, feed themselves, honestly, at an emotional level. So they they don't, there's, there's right. a there's a checking out or a disconnect between, um, yeah, I would like to lose weight or I would like to manage my eating, but that's just, you know, there's more pressing things. They don't, they don't, it's just hard for them to create the space. And, that, and if you just keep asking why, 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 and you get all the way down to the bottom, it's usually a worthiness issue or a feeling not enough. Absolutely. Um, and I'm so glad that you brought this up because the pattern that you are identifying is actually a coping mechanism. It is actually something I, I teach um, in my programs as well. And it's what I call resignation. We just resign to the fact that, you know, it is the way it is and there's nothing we can do about it, particularly when it comes to our health as women, to our well-being, um, and to our own personal power. And it is a coping mechanism to avoid difficult feelings because if we actually accepted that things can change, that if we actually accepted that we can be free from emotional eating, that we don't have to worry about food anymore, then we don't have excuses. Then we actually have to show up. 
And for a lot of people, that can feel like an oh crap moment. Like, oh my gosh. Like, it's like I'd rather be now ignorant. I'm going to be <laughs> I'd rather have not known that right. I'm responsible for managing my own emotional state and for putting myself at a higher priority because I'm worth it. That for people is like, what? Right. But, <laughs> right. But it is also the paradigm that we're moving into. I do truly believe that the paradigm of self-abnegation, which is self-sacrifice, um, is is ending, and we are starting to move into a new paradigm of, um, you know, really taking care of ourselves. But here's the thing: like what we're talking about, we're talking about our health. We're not talking about making more money. We're not talking about, you know, doing more in business. Like we're talking about the bare basics of survival as human beings. And if we are resigned to just whatever, I'm just going to eat whatever I want, whenever I want, this is never going to change, then we are literally playing with fire. And I was, um, I'm in the process of preparing for my upcoming retreat called The Escape. And um, one of the things that we're going to be focusing on is the root of emotional eating, which is judgment. One of the roots of emotional eating is judgment. And I just started to do some research about how the energy of judgment will manifest itself into a uh, into disease, into physical health issues. And I had to stop the list like once I reached a page because there was so much. Like, Mm. I mean, like what we're talking about is our health. So if we don't take care of ourselves, we're talking about getting Alzheimer's, cancer, digestive issues, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, headaches and migraines, uh, skin issues. I mean, the list was so long that I was, that like, I honestly had to stop and take a pause because it was really starting to upset me Mm. that there is such an ignorance that happens when it comes to our health. And then we go to the doctor and we wonder why the doctor is telling us to do something differently, that we're not healthy. Because it's in these moments, right? It's in the choices, it's in the day-to-day where we have to say, you know what? This can change. You know what? I'm going to make a good choice here. I'm going to honor myself and my needs, even if it's different than anyone else around me. I'm going to show up for myself today because we are all we have. We can't take anything else with us except for our own selves. Mm. And if we don't start showing up today for our own selves, then we really can't show up for anyone else. Yeah. And it's really interesting that you're talking about, you know, this paradigm of self-abnegation is sort of coming to a close. I think there's a collective consciousness awakening around, hey, if we're really going to heal disease, if we're really going to heal poverty, if we're really going to heal, you know, all these things happening, uh, we have to let go of this martyr <laughs> sort of syndrome um, of putting ourselves lower on the list of self of care. Really, um, I I just went to a training over the weekend where um, it was it was a, it was about um, it was more spiritual, but they talked a lot about how at the root of most soul sickness, it's judgment. So it totally lines up with what you just talked about, that the soul sickness that we experience is almost almost 100% of the time, it's about self-judgment. And so a lot of people that are mm-hmm. heavy into, well, first of all, emotional weight manifests as physical weight at some point. Um, like you said, people that aren't Absolutely. heavy physically, the people that aren't heavy physically will either work out to get it off so that it's not physical weight, but um, they are obese emotionally. <laughs> and uh, it, it can manifest in many ways, but that emotional weight is so heavy. And um, I have uh, heard it call it uh, heard it called like deep pressed, like deep pressing down the emotion rather than letting it express. So depression mm-hmm. usually 
um, and this is not always, but typically depression is born of some kind. I mean, there's so many organic and other issues, but um, usually, and maybe you would agree with me on this, that eating disorders and depression and anxiety often go together because depression is usually about regret, shame, or shoulda, woulda, coulda. It's about living in the past and anxiety is about what might happen in the future. So they're all, they're both on the same spectrum, but depression lives in the past and it's usually about judgment. Whereas anxiety is future based and it's the eventuality of what could happen based on me being a loser, based on my past history, right? So both of them are about judgment. So I found that really interesting that we judge ourselves spiritually. We judge ourselves. Even We even judge ourselves that we can't let go of the emotions we need to let go of. We even, there's probably even people judging themselves listening to this conversation. Like, how come I can't get to a place where I can manage my stress? How come I can't figure out why I'm eating this way? How come I can't? And the list goes on and on and on. So for someone who's sort of stuck in that right. really self-sabotaging cycle of self-judgment, which is a very natural state of the human ego, we all do it. So it's not, it's every 100% of human beings have this uh, ego pattern. So what have you found to kind of wake people up to, oh my gosh, I'm in judgment. How do I... Because if we're ever going to get to the root of why they're eating in that on that emotional level, it's probably tied into judgment or something. So how do you, what have you seen as really helpful for people to kind of wake up out of that pattern or to create a state change around that? Well, to be continued, because I am uh, working on the retreat for it right now, but I will say in what you shared about how like we are we are so addicted in a way to judgment i mean if we surveyed um everyone who is listening i bet even before most of the listeners opened their eyes they were experiencing some form of judgment um like i'm tired i didn't get enough sleep therefore today's gonna suck or I can't believe I ate that last night. My belly aches now. Um, like I have to, you know, do something about it. Um, or they wake up, they look at the clock and they tell themselves, I don't have enough time, right? These are all examples of judgment. And then as we start to move through our day, um, those thoughts continue um, and they'll happen when we look in the mirror or we'll even judge our partners before they even say something. Um, in, and part of any process of transformation, definitely with emotional eating, but any process whatsoever is simply starting with awareness. And the first step in in awareness when it comes to judgment is where are you not at peace where are you not at peace with yourself and you know are you not at peace when you look in the mirror are you not at peace when you get dressed in the morning are you not in, at peace when you're having an exchange with you know your husband or your kids or your clients or things like that. Um, but just starting to recognize like, where are you not at peace is the doorway for transformation. Um, and I know that you're, you're very um, spiritual and I'm sure your listeners are as well. Um, but I've been a student of A Course in Miracles um, for over a year and a half now. I love um, I've studied that. with Love it. Okay. So like in the principles of miracles, like it's like page one, it says that um, there's no order of difficulty in miracles, meaning that one is not bigger or more difficult than another, meaning that the issues that you have with food are no bigger and no difficult than deciding what shoes you're going to put on your feet. It's like literally like a Course in Miracles breaks it down and says everything is equal and valuable 
nothing is more difficult than another. So when it comes to this, this addiction and the addiction to judgment, but also um, the compulsion with food and this energy of resignation that we've been talking about, that like nothing can change. Literally this, you know, the spiritual text of A Course in Miracles, page one, like I think it's the second line is saying there's no order of difficulty in miracles. And the only difficulty that you are experiencing is the thing that you are bringing to the situation yourself. And it's about the thinking that you bring to the situation. So if you are saying this is going to be difficult, this is going to be hard, that's exactly what you're going to get. But the miracle is, and the recognition that it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be so hard. And where am I making this harder than it needs to be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wasn't aware that that was at the very beginning of the course, but that's very powerful. My favorite uh, quote from the course or truth from the course is, you think you have many problems, but you only have one problem disconnection from God and the disconnection Mm -hmm. from God and however people define that the disconnection from their source from the divine from you know that light that disconnection creates fear so I love that the course has a whole love versus kind of fear uh, sort of um rhetoric right that's kind of how I see it if I were to just like totally Mm -hmm. like parse it down is that we go into fear when we disconnect from love because love is God. And so we go into that self-judgment when we don't feel God inside of us, when we don't feel that light or that divinity inside. And that's that soul sickness I was referring to. So, um, so probably what you teach is just connection principles, I would assume. Sort of what I teach too is just bringing people back in to connect back in to that source for themselves. Right. And, you know, the method of emotional eating is simply a way that we run away from ourselves. It is, I mean, if we really boil it down, it is a method of running away from what we truly need. Mm. And that is, you know, love, safety, belonging, a sense of happiness, you know, everything that we've been talking about. And if we are not feeding those needs, you know, on an emotional level, like we've been saying, they will act themselves out in our relationship with food. Wow. So, I mean, you said you've been on this you know, you're in your early 30s, right? So um, you started kind of that emotional eating yes. pattern. You can identify it at about age six that continued for like 27 years. But you've been um, doing this professionally. You've been doing this as a business and talking about this for about like eight years, right? So this is something you're yes. really narrowed in on and really focused on. I love to see women who choose a pathway and they really really climb into it and they and they like voraciously learn and read and research um and you strike me as somebody who's really doing that which is a beautiful service to people um i know that you have a few tips on your website as well because i was just kind of looking through and seeing um that you that you you know you have workshops you have um you uh, one of the other things i liked about your style is that um you're, you see the gift and the compulsion. Like there's always, like we don't want to shame ourselves and say, we need to be doing this because we're going to get sick and, you know, we're going to get diabetes or we're going to get cancer or whatever. It's really like, hey, you know, mm-hmm. how do we unpack this and look at it as an actual gift? Because for you, wouldn't you say that you're grateful to the st- point that you had this compulsion um, that that you had to walk through that because now you can look at it and go, wow, that, that gift that I woke up to who I am, or I woke up to now I get to share this with people. I mean, how did you, how did you kind of create that, um, peace and passion really now? And how did that sort of evolve from kind of the awakening to the now? Does that make sense? Like you woke up to, oh my gosh, like, yeah, 
this is something I really want to climb into and get so it can help others. So how did that, how did that evolve? I don't think I recognized what a gift my compulsion with food was until two years ago, to be quite honest. And at that point, I was already two years since I had been emotionally eating. So well on the other side. Um, And I'm going to start to get emotional, so I apologize. Um, But I don't think it really hit me what a gift um, healing my emotional eating was until after I got married. Um, And I come from a long history of uh, alcoholism. And my parents, um, I'm so grateful because they never engaged in that coping mechanism. Um, They basically said, you know, alcoholism stops here with us. Um, But because the the roots of the compulsion were not healed, it shifted into compulsive eating. So that's really where a lot of my emotional eating first got modeled was was from my parents. Um, And I didn't realize... um, you know, what an undertaking um, it meant for me and my family, you know, to be, to really say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this unfinished business. I'm going to heal the roots of this. So I don't pass this on um, to my children. Um, It's not something that we engage with in our family. You know, it's like, it's like, here's where the buck stops. Um, And as I look back over my life, um, I feel so blessed and grateful um, that I that I took this on. I don't think I really understood what I was doing at first. I just wanted to stop feeling tortured by food. Um, And never, ever did I think it would open as many doors and opportunities as it has. Um, But I think it really hit me like I said, like after I got married um, and recognizing that like I have the ability to create my life um, and I have the ability to say what I allow into my life and what I don't allow in um, and, you know, to, to really be in a family like with my husband and to have dinners with him and to not feel compulsive around food, like to be fully present um, is like just one thing. But how we do food is how we do everything. It really is like how we do one thing is how we do everything. Mm -hmm. So um, like looking back and seeing like how many people I've helped and healed and then hearing their stories about how they passed it on to their children and how they're doing things differently in their family. I mean, I truly deeply believe that if you're an emotional eater, I do truly believe that the universe is tapping you on the shoulder and being like, heal this because there's something I have to tell you. Mm-hmm. And it's through that process of healing that you will learn what you need to know. Um, and that's truly what I believe. How beautiful and how wonderful that you've been able to transmute this in your family dynamic. Because even though your parents didn't express the actual disease of alcoholism, those traits can be passed down. Um You could call it the quote unquote addictive personality, but usually someone in the family line will actually help to transmute or metastasize that so it doesn't continue to be passed down. And I think that kind of circles back to what you were saying about how we're kind of collectively shifting out of the paradigm of self abnegation because I think a lot of the people on the earth who are awakening are going, hey, just because this dynamic was playing out in my family of origin or generationally, it stops here. So your parents sort of like started that for you and then you're just carrying the torch forward to complete the healing cycle. So I'm sure your children will be, if you decide to have children, um, will be able to not have that same struggle, if you will. They will, they will have, you will have like, it literally did end there, right? It did end with you. So really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And I love that quote because you said it, you know, because the Course of Miracle teaches how we do one thing is how we do everything. And we don't like to hear that. <laughs> um, it's, it's a powerful truth. And it's also like, oh, man, you know, because we like to have our vices. We like to have our closeted things that we just keep putting behind us and go, I'll deal with that later. Um, you know, I've got too much going on, but it'll keep showing up and it'll show up in different ways. And it seeps into our daily yeah. existence until we look at it. Like you said, it's kind of the universe tapping on your shoulder yeah. going, hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I when I healed my emotional eating, the next thing that immediately I felt the effects of that in is my relationship with money. Um, and then it, you know, then moved into um, my relationship with my husband and, you know, it continues to ripple out and ripple out. Um, so like I'm speaking directly to the person who's like, Oh man, you mean how I do one thing is how I do everything. And I want to be like, yeah, yeah, it is. Because once we heal it in this aspect, it's going to be an easy copy and paste to all these different areas <laughs> and it's going to blow your mind. So let's get to work. Like let's just focus on food because it's the thing that we do the most often. It's the thing that we engage with the most out of anything else we do in our lives. And if we can focus there, then we can literally copy and paste what you learn here to your relationship with money, your intimate relationships, your business, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's a great way to to pull this together because I think it can be really overwhelming when you look at all of the weaknesses you have as a human um, and all of the ways that you are unconsciously like self-sabotaging and, and it can, we, like you said, we could get really in our head and I'm a natural analyzer. That's just me. <laughs> like I want to figure out why things happen and how they happen. And so it's really easy for me to play there in analysis and it makes that, you know, analysis paralysis happen. But anyway, so yeah, we could get really overwhelmed, but it really, it really does come down to this, like, how do I foster, like you said, that first piece of like, where am I not feeling the peace? What, I don't know how you phrased it, but mm -hmm. it was like, how do I, where am I not at peace? Where am I not at peace? So creating that self-awareness on that, that I think is the most beautiful starting place to go within and say, you know, I value peace. I value it. And so I want it and I deserve to have peace in my life. So where am I not bringing mm -hmm. that in? Where is that being cut off? How is that not flowing for me? Um, and I love the definition of emotional eating being a method of running away from ourselves. And it's a soul disconnection. Mm -hmm. It's a soul disconnection. And um, so... I'm sure people can find some really beautiful truths on your website. I'll have some links there in the show notes, but if you don't read the show notes, the um, Jessica Prosini's website is escape from emotional eating.com. And um, I'd love to bring you back, Jessica, for my, I, I do, I'm starting a one year um, mentoring group mentoring program where we just tackle a lot of different um, arenas of our lives in terms of like we take a topic a month and I definitely from the onset of the program talk about eating. I have 12 principles of spiritual eating that I incorporate and I would love to bring you back as a visiting expert to help us walk through a little bit more of that so we can explore that next year. Um, but thank you for being our guest today and I'm just going to encourage people to go to your website and take that quiz because wouldn't you say your quiz is a tool for self-awareness and getting people to see where they're at so that they can just wake up to yeah. worth it <laughs> or feeling like they're worth it? Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, like we were talking about, awareness is the first step and that people tell me all the time how that quiz is really eye-opening. Um, and even for those of you who may already know, you know, you're an emotional eater. Take it anyway, because there's always something new you can learn. And then it'll talk about next steps from there as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time today. 
Thank you for having me. This has been an amazing conversation. I hope it's so helpful for the people who are listening to. Oh, I'm sure it will be. Thank you. Hey, thanks for joining us on this episode and really feeling into maybe your own experience with eating and how your soul voice wants to speak to you when you want to check out. Yeah, our whole thing about the soul voice is it really just wants us to check in and align and stop the escapism, stop the numbing out. There's just this like whole thing about hiding out. We get really good at it. As she talked about, and I've heard the phrase before, how we do one thing is how we do everything. So I would invite you to really feel into like, hey, hey, where am I running away? What am I using as escape methods and escape routes to keep me from tuning in and listening to my true soul voice? And that is exactly the kind of thing we would be in training ourselves on and getting good at listening to during my Stand, Speak, Shine, Embodying Your Feminine Soul, step into yourself retreat quite a mouthful (laughs) but we are gonna go there we are gonna really get clear on the ways or the one thing that keeps us from really getting into our bodies and really really lining up the soul and the body because again that is where our true power is and it's how we show up on this earth we've got one life and we've got one body to walk in with it so let's find happiness there let's find peace there so you can go find that on my website shereeburton.com right at the very top there's a place to register there and like I said at the beginning I think we have about 15 spots left so we're filling up fast have a great week and we'll talk to you again on Women Seeking Wholeness Wednesday